Glory to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Illumine our hearts, O Sovereign Master, who loves mankind, with the pure light of thy wisdom, and open the eyes of our mind to the understanding of thy proclamation of the gospel. Implant in us also the fear of thy blessed commandments, that trampling down all carnal appetites, we may lead the godly life, both thinking and doing always such things as are well pleasing in thy sight. But thou art the sanctification, our souls and bodies unto thee, we ascribe glory to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever and in the ages of ages. Amen. Amen. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for being here. If you notice that this morning's prayer was a little bit different, that is because that is one of the prayers that the priest says during Orthros, or Matins, uh, at the very beginning. And the reason I recited that is because we're going to talk about Orthros today, <clears throat> and uh, one of the preparatory services for the divine liturgy. And so, unfortunately, we don't go to Orthros because it's during this class. But one of these days, we will go to Orthros as a class just to experience that and to um, understand it a little bit better. But we'll talk about it today. <clears throat> and it's one of the most important services in the Orthodox Church. And it's called Orthros in Greek or Matins uh, from the Latin word for morning. Now, the Orthros can be chanted every single day as it is a commemoration of the saint or feast of a particular day or a period of the church calendar. It typically begins early in the morning and immediately precedes the divine liturgy, although it can be chanted alone. And so orthos, uh, from the Greek, uh, means morning or dawn or daybreak. And oftentimes, particularly in monastic uh, settings, it starts even before the sun comes up, right at that dawn, daybreak period. It's the longest and most complex of the cycle of the daily services of the church. In its entirety, typically in monastic settings, it can last up to three hours. So if you think our services are long. And they chant all of the canons, all of the kathismata that we'll talk about. And so that's why it can go up to three hours. Now, the Orthro service illustrates and recreates uh, experientially and literally the time period prior to Christ's arrival on earth. And so that's what the Orthros uh, typifies. As we learn about it, about the prophecies in the Old Testament, and as we near the end of Orthros, the theme becomes more Christ-centered in preparation for the second part of the Eucharistic play, which is the divine liturgy, which itself portrays Christ's life on earth, his death and resurrection, and the promise of return. And as we study the liturgy this year, you'll see how all different parts of the liturgy recreate Jesus' life, his ministry, and then his uh, passion and resurrection. Now, finally, at the end of Orthros, the great doxology is sort of a bridge between Orthros and the liturgy, and it serves to illustrate Christ's birth and a new beginning. So in all, Orthros is a revitalization of the law, the Old Testament law, and it's shown in a new light and with a new focus away from the types of the Old Testament to the experience of Christ's life and the acts of repentance and salvation. And the Orthros also serves as a teaching tool, actually, uh, because if you listen to the hymns and the readings, uh, they outline the lives of the saints being celebrated that day. And so one of the things I uh, learned uh, from a priest a while ago 
is that if you go to Vespers and Madness or Orthros, you can learn a lot of theology just by listening to the hymns and the readings. Charlie, if we look at the insight on the bulletin today, we have some, uh, the one page of everything that's happening for the day. Is that what's being used in Orthros? Yes. Yes, and that's a good point. When we read, uh, when we hear some of the hymns today, they will be because of the, the uh, readings that are assigned for that day. So we learn about the lives and the trials of the saints, tribulations, their triumphs, and through those uh, readings and hymns, we can learn uh, from their example how to lead a more spiritual uh, life. A, a great doxology is that um, what we start when everybody stands up? Yes. Okay. Glory to thee who has shown us the and, light. And then it goes back and forth to the chamber and father and chamber. Yep. Okay. That's exactly it. And that is why it's sort of a bridge from we finish Orthros and now you're going to be starting the divine liturgy. So that's why the chanters do two. It's two. Yes. Yeah, and normally uh, Father Michael and uh, Deacon Justin do uh, part of the chanting. Uh, in most churches, it's just the chanters. Uh, and a lot of it, I think, depends on the priest. Uh, often when a bishop is there, he will also want to participate in the great doxology. I mean, to me, that makes sense to the bridge, you know, that you're talking about. You've got a chanter doing everything, and then also now it's the priest to get involved in yeah, and I would say when it's the chanter's part of the doxology, we should all even try to uh, sing it as well. It's it's a wonderful uh, part of the service, uh, and as we'll see a little bit later, uh, it really does show us a new beginning, literally Christ appearing on earth. You should be in church by that time. Yes, <laughs> but it's a good point. If, you be, if we're not here, out of here, and get to the, by the great doxology, I've gone away over the <laughs> So it's probably also the only time on Sunday mornings when the splendor of divine, uh, of Byzantine music can be really truly appreciated. Uh, it's when the style of the hymnography and, uh, can be really appreciated and you, you can see an, an evolution of the hymns uh, from the early part of the uh, church's history right up to about the 16th or 17th century. And we are really blessed to have a wonderful Byzantine choir led by uh, Nick Ayu and uh, 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 Greg and Christiana, and Christiana that do just a, a, a masterful job of singing the Byzantine hymns. So we're talking about Orthros today. So this, the start of Orthros features brisk and short hermologic hymns, which are the oldest of church. And we're going to do a lot of uh, uh, definitions today, Rob. So hermos, hermos, uh, we see that in our hymn books. What that means is the initial hymn of an ode of a canon presenting the rhythmic and melodic pattern for that canon. So the first ode is the earmost, and that sets the pattern for how you're going to sing the rest of those verses. So those are the earliest uh, chants in uh, Orthros. Then the service evolves into what they call the idiomila. Idiomila is two words. Idiom meaning unique, and mila is melody. So it's now a different melody, unique melody, uh, which reflects the later poetic style between the 19th, 9th, and 16th centuries and finalizes into a slow, stichariotic or doxax, doxastica, mm -hmm. which are hymns of glory. When you see doxa, that's Greek for glory. And that's where the, the great doxology usually begins. And so you get this whole range of Byzantine styles in the in the Orthros service. Even the Protestant Church had doxology. Really? Okay. Oh, yeah. Who 
So again, that, that sort of carries over into giving glory to God, to the Trinity particularly. So the first part of uh, Orthros actually begins with what they call the six Psalms. And they're usually read. And it's from the Greek exosalmos. And that's, again, in conjunction of two Greek words, exe, which means six, and psalmos, psalm. And they're read at the very start of Orthros. By the way, hexi, you'll sometimes see it with an H. So hex, hexi is also a six for Greek. The set consists of Psalms 3, 37, 62, 87, 102, and 142, during which the priest says a series of 12 short silent prayers, one of them, which we just I just read at the beginning here, usually six in front of the altar, and then six outside the royal doors in front of the icon of Christ on the icon of stuff. Now, that six to six is a little bit variable. Uh, in some of our service books, it's three inside of the uh, altar and nine up in front of the icon of stuff. So, but some are inside, some are outside. You'll see why shortly. Colonel, are the, are the songs that are read Matters. Yes, different from vast verse. Yes, yes. These six psalms are particular for mass for Orthodox service. Uh, they are not read on any of the any of the other services, as far as I know. And so, the reading of the six psalms is uh, one of the most solemn points of Orthodox. In monasteries, it's read by the presiding priest. But here in most parishes, it's read by the reader. And usually uh, when he's here, David Robinson reads the, the Psalms. Now, why is this significant? The sixth Psalm is one of the most important parts of the Orthros. It's a time when all should put aside all other thoughts, stand quietly and concentrate on these penitential prayers. Truly, really, it's one of the holiest moments in the Orthros service. Almost all of these psalms, five of the six, are very penitential in nature. The psalms are a summary of the Christian life, highlighting the sorrow that we so often meet along the way to our eternal joy. In other words, the sorrows of everyday life that we all uh, experience. In some traditions, all the candles or lights in the church are extinguished when these psalms are read. Like I said, often this service starts early, in the morning, so when all the lights are off, it's literally almost completely dark in the church. Uh, this along with the phrase, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men, which is said right before these psalms, calls to mind the dark night when Christ was born. So literally, these words come right from the gospel. It affords us concentration on the psalm's words. One of the bishops of the uh, Russian Orthodox Church said this, these lights are turned off so that we, able to see nothing with our eyes, might listen to the six psalms attentively and with the fear of God so that everyone standing in the dark might shed a tear or release a tender sigh. In other words, since these are penitential psalms, uh, we really need to reflect on our sins and uh, sort of take this time to have a personal repentance, so to speak. For at night, if there's no lighted candle nearby, it's difficult for people to see one another, so you can kind of let it out a little more. And it's for this reason that the rubric directs that the lights be extinguished. Thus, we pronounce the six psalms with all attentiveness and fear of God, as if we we're conversing with our invisible Christ God himself from praying over our sins. Uh, Stuff Deacon Nicholas told me that literally there's no movement behind the altar, behind the sanctuary, in the sanctuary. Everyone stands still and hearing those psalms. And uh, in fact, in some traditions, there's not even crossing oneself or venerating icons. All attention is on 
the words of these songs. So generally, where the, the liturgy is talking about Christ, the Eucharist, the light of the world, so it's all about life. You're saying the opposite of that is Orthodox words of dark. In the beginning, in the beginning, during these six psalms, that's a good point. During these six psalms, there's more of a darkness, an attentional nature, and a real reflective time. So I'm going to go through some of the uh, all of the songs actually very briefly, and what they mean. Uh, for the song number three, uh, this is one of the priests in the in the uh, church. He says, "A conflict we have here in this life, and the distress that that conflict brings for fighting battles, is one of the major motifs of the Book of Psalms. If you read the Psalms, there's always some some somewhat of a conflict pattern to them." When you hear the songs and read them. This is not a prayer book for the non-combatant. And unless a person is actually engaged in hostilities, it's difficult to see how he can pray Psalm number three. And when you read it, you'll hear things like, Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you have smitten all my enemies on the job. You have broken the teeth of the ungodly. You get a sense there's a real battle going on. Okay. And uh, these psalms are prayers for those engaged in an ongoing spiritual conflict. No one else need bother even opening the book. Now, again, this is Father Reardon saying this, but what he's saying is if you're, if you're in a spiritual struggle, if you're in a spiritual battle, then read the psalms. And that's how you should actually read them, with that mindset. And what are our resources in this battle? Well, again, this is what the psalm says. But you, O Lord, are a shield to me, my glory and my head support. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me from his holy hill. I will not fear the thousands that confront me round about. Salvation is of the Lord, and your blessing rests upon your people. So we have the conflict. We also have an idea of what our help is in this conflict. And it's God, as, as the psalmist says, is you are my help, O oh Lord, you're my shield. The next psalm is psalm, psalm 37. Again, there are enemies. Who are the enemies? They're the demons. Demons are the only enemies of the person who correctly prays the book of Psalms. When we read these, we think, well, David's writing these and he's writing about enemies around him. And that is true in a historical sense. But now for our, for our church purposes, the enemies that we read about here are the demons. Okay, those are our enemies. Nowhere does Holy Scripture is, exhort us to forgive or pity the demons. They are the only true enemies that our prayer recognizes. Unlike human enemies <clears throat> who are to be prayed for, the demons are always to be prayed against. So one of the great commandments, one of the difficult commandments of Christ was love your enemies, pray for them, that harm you. Well, this is what Christ means. Pray for your human enemies, but here we're praying against the demons. Because they are our true enemies. They're the ones that war against us. Our fight with the demons is on sleeping, as is their fight with us, plotting our ruin. And this psalm, psalm says, those who seek my life lay snared for me. Those who seek my hurt speak of destruction and plan deception all the day long. So this gives you an idea that the demons are unsleeping. They don't sleep, they don't eat. They don't do anything but fight against us. There's no hope for that. And that's right. They are not capable of repentance. For whatever reason, when they fell, that was it. There was no turning back for Satan and his demons. For human beings, there is repentance. That's, that's what differentiates us from them. And that's why Christ came into the world to offer repentance and salvation. Uh, God didn't give up on, on man. So as time goes on, Charlie, are there more demons? 
Like, do more demons join the ranks of the demons? As far as I understand, there's a finite amount, and that has not changed. So the demons that are there, that's it. That's it. The ones that fell, fell, and the ones that stayed with God stayed, and there was no changing of that number. More than we can imagine. Thousands and thousands is what the scriptures say. Uh, so yes, an, almost an infinite, a finite but large number. Always. Pardon? I said always. Yes, yes. So that's Psalm, Psalm 47. And that's what is Psalm 62. Now, it's one of the Bible's most intense prayers of yearning. The words of Psalm 62 open the mind to what the Holy Spirit prays to God within our souls. We've heard that Christ said, the Holy Spirit will pray for you, within you. Psalm 62 is one of those types of psalms. At the same time, the soul's spiritual enemies are ever present, and they too are referenced within this psalm when it says, those who vainly seek my soul, those uh, who are destined to be delivered to the hands of the sword, and to be a portion of foxes. If that's what's going to happen to the demons. They are going to be eventually defeated. <clears throat> as, as a prayer for longing for communion with God, Psalm 62 is especially to be recommended as partial preparation for Holy Communion. So as part of our preparation for communion, uh, for the Divine Liturgy, Psalm 62 is uh, often recommended to be read. Psalm 87 is the most bitter of the penitential psalms. During the reading of the most bitter of the psalms, Psalm 87, the priest leaves the altar to read some of the rest of his 12 prayers, which include intercessions for those standing in church and for the forgiveness of their sins. And that's when the priest comes out of the sanctuary and stands in front of the icon of Christ and finishes his uh, prayers. This act of the priest coming out of the sanctuary and coming in front of the iconostas symbolizes Christ who heard the mourning of mankind and left his heavenly throne to rescue us and ultimately shared in the suffering that Psalm 87 describes. So literally, as the priest comes out of the sanctuary, that's Christ coming down from heaven to save us, to literally give us the, the salvation that he came for. And I'll read just some of the verses from 87 so you can get a, uh, a feel for it. It says, Wherefore, O Lord, dost thou cast off my soul and turnest thy face away from me? Now imagine Christ in this scenario. A poor man am I, and in troubles from my youth, yea, having been exalted, I was humbled and brought to distress. This is his passion. This is what he underwent on the way to Golgotha. Thy furies have passed upon me. Thy terrors have sorely troubled me. They came around about me like water. All the day long they have compassed me about together. Thou hast removed far from me my friend and neighbor and my acquaintance because of my misery. So you can see Psalm 87 really brings home the suffering that Christ underwent, and also the suffering that we undergo in our spiritual battles. Now, suddenly, the Psalms take a turn, a different uh, uh, attitude, and that's Psalm 102. During Vespers last night, Psalm 103 was the Psalm of creation. Bless the Lord, O my soul, how great art thou, thou hast made heaven and earth, etc., etc. Now, Psalm 102, the soul is called to the contemplation of God's infinite forgiving mercy. We have all these psalms about the struggles, the spiritual uh, battles, and now Psalm 102 gives us some hope, gives us a glimpse of, of God's mercy. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy, he has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. 
So we don't lose hope. We understand that indeed uh, God does not re uh, de reward us according to our iniquities. As St. Paul writes in the book of the Romans, while we were still sinners, God died for us. It wasn't when we were friends with God, but actually when we had rebelled against him, that he came down and died for our sins. And I'll go through just some of the verses in 102. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. You see the, the tone of this, the tenor of this song is all positive. It's all uh, uplifting. Who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The, or the Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made his ways known to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. This goes back to the Old Testament. From the very beginning, God has shown mercy on his people. He's merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in mercy. And we have to look at that and remember that. He's long-suffering. He puts up with a lot with us. And so he is merciful and gracious. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are so high above the earth, so great is his mercy for those who fear him. Here, the prophet David is trying to really kind of in human terms, make us understand how far away our sinfulness is from his mercy. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us, as a father, father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. So again, very uplifting, very positive, giving us hope that in the midst of these six Psalms of almost darkness, there's a light at the end of the heaven. And then finally, Psalm 142, that's the last one. Uh, one of the uh, saints of the English church, actually, Bede, was a, a monk in the medieval uh, English church. He said this about Psalm 142. This history of how David is persecuted by his son. If you read the book of Kings, uh, one of David's sons, Absalom, and David had a big fight. And he literally persecuted David. And uh, the Venerable Bede says, this is similar, as some would have it, uh, is extended to every Christian who is harassed in the bitterness of this world by raging sins, as it were, his own children. But against this is the supposed remedial penitence, which the psalm contains. In other words, our sins are like our own children fighting against us. And so that's what Psalm 142 uh, reflects. Now, there is also a tradition in the church which says that the sixth psalm will be read to each one of us by our guardian angels at the last judgment. And that's why in the churches, when these six psalms are read, there's no movement, there's no distraction because this kind of reflects what's happening at the Last Judgment. And this is from St. Paisios of Athenite. He says that during this time of the reading of the six Psalms, the whole world will be judged. So this is, when you talk about the Last Judgment, and this is one of the elders of the church, uh, and he's saying that this is kind of how the Last Judgment is going to be. Every person's Guardian angel will read these psalms, and this is what the judgment will be. The Lord will hold the book of life, which is the gospel, and it will be open, and immediately we will move to the right or to the left ourselves because we will know if we are destined to go to paradise or not. The last judgment will be our own judgment. We will know at that point. Mm -hmm what we have done. 
on the iconostas, where all the icons are, Christ's icon depicts him holding a closed book. Now, you're going to look at this icon and you can say, the book's open. Charlie, what are you talking about? I don't know if you can see it. This is the icon of Christ. Was his house. No, no, his book is open. You see it on the iconist. Yeah, on the iconist. Oh, 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 yeah. The one, I'm sorry, the one on my screen is closed. In our main church, the book is closed. Okay. So this is not a hard and fast rule, but for the most part, the book that Christ is holding in his hand is closed because it's unknown. The book is still closed. There's still time for mercy at this time of our life. So the book's not open. The deeds are not. Because it says in, in Revelation, the books will be open and all our, you know, the judgment will occur. When the book is closed, as it is in, in the icon in the main church, that means that it's still a time of mercy. There's still time for our, our name to be written in the book of life. Uh, you don't have to go back to it, but the slide before you were talking about how on the judgment day we would either go to the left or the right and right receipt. So I, this might be hard to answer, but are we supposed to assume that because we're by ourselves that we might not know if our family is there, or we would when, when will we know that they made it at that time? You right compared to at that time, time. Okay. everyone will know okay. where everybody is, and our hope is that we're all going. With all of those, all of our loved ones. But the point is now at this time, uh, now is the time to prepare for that, for that judgment time. All right, any any other questions about the sixth psalm? I know I took a lot of time with that, but uh, that was an important part of the Arthros, and that's why we uh, we try to be attention. The next part of Arthros, we hear God is the Lord. Who hath appeared unto us, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Now, Rob, now light is starting to shine on the Orthro service. It was dark. We read those psalms, and now the lights start to come on. And this is uh, this is done every Orthro. It's unchanging. And then I think it's four, uh, three verses. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord and call upon His holy name. And then the refrain: God is the Lord. Who hath appeared unto us, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Verse number two, all nations come to me about. In the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. And then the refrain, God is the Lord that hath appeared unto us. And finally, this is the Lord's doing and is marvelous in our eyes. So the, now the Byzantine choir is chanting these verses. And now we can see the light of Christ dawning in the Orthros service. This is followed by the apolitikia. Apolitikia are the dismissal hymns. Uh, the word comes from the Greek word apolisis, which means dismissal. These hymns were sung at the end of Vespers. That's why they're called the dismissal hymns. And now they're sung again in Orthros. And usually they're the resurrectional hymns that we hear. And so when you open the the both of the little pamphlet today, you'll see, you'll see the apotheon of the resurrection, and then the one of the saint of the day, and then the one of Saint Nicholas. These are the ones that were read last night at Vespers, and now they're read today. They consist of the day's resurrectional hymns, uh, and the one for the saint of the day, which today will be Saint Thomas the Apostle. <clears throat> so you'll hear. His apolitician read or or some. Is there eight different ones for the eight tones, or are there one? Uh, it depends on the uh, yes, eight resurrectional tones. So those rotate week every week, and then the same one is different for the saint of the day or the feast day. The patron saint is always the same, and then the theotokia, and that's the the one that we sing to the theotokos. In normal times, it's um, uh, the one we will, will see today in our uh, O Undisputed Intercessor of Christians. Mm -hmm. During Lent, it is to thee the champion leader. So that is very But those are the, uh, what they call the apolitikia. These hymns uh, vary according to the tone of the week. 
Next come the katasmata. These are from the Greek uh, meaning katisma, which means to sit, seat. And these are resurrectional hymns chanted when the faithful are typically seated. The word akestas, akestas means no seating, no seating, standing. And so it sounds like an owl. Yeah. This katismata. Uh, <laughs> It does. That's so, what cathedral means too, right? I mean, the cathedral you see. Yes, that's right. And so, that, yeah, that's that's the Latin I think of the of the uh, equivalent of this. So the Kanismata are usually read, and uh, this in current practices there are two Kanismata, three verses, with the third one being uh, a Theotokian, a hymn of Theotokos. And so if you if you look at the, the uh, red service book, you'll see what I mean. There's a first first cathisma, it has three verses, and then second cathisma, three verses. Again, the, now we're starting to get the resurrectional tone of Orthros. Orthros, <clears throat> I would say the main uh, theme of it is the resurrection of Christ. Well, Next, can we go back to that last? What's a resurrectional theotokos? Uh, it's uh, a hymn of the theotokos that has resurrectional uh, uh, impact to it. I, I heard of it. No, a hymn of Christ. Yeah. Christ. Yeah. yeah. It, what it does is it hymns the theotokos who gave birth to he who rose from the dead. Okay. Yeah. Next is the Evlokitiria. Evlokitiria. This is my favorite, one of my favorites in uh, in Orthros. With few exceptions, these hymns or troperi are chanted every Sunday during Orthros and encapsulate the story of the resurrection in eight hymns. They're called Evlokitiria simply because each hymn begins with a verse, Evlokitosikiria, which is, Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. The company of the angels was amazed as they beheld the numbered among the dead. It's a, almost like an anthem, and it's very, it's sung very uh, the same every San, every Sunday in the same tone, same moment. Almost all of the verses are uh, talk about the myrrh bearing myth. That's the second major theme of Orthro. A lot of it is about the myrrh bearing women, myrrh bearing women and the resurrection. So you'll see these two themes coming together in Orthros a lot. Last question. Yes. Father David was talking about the myrrh bearing women and how they never did get to do, and they never were allowed to anoint Christ because he was already risen. So why is that so important? That's a good question for me, because the Murberry women on their way to the tomb were the first to know of the resurrection. Before any of the apostles, before any of the male disciples of Christ, the Murberry women were the first to be aware of the resurrection. And so they were what we would call the apostles to the, uh, the male apostles. They gave the good news of the resurrection of Christ to all the other disciples. So they are considered the harbingers of the resurrection. Okay. And I think that's why they're so uh, emphasized in Orthodox. They came because they're in the Right. Yes. The letters from the resurrection. Exactly. And that's why the angel says to them, why do you lament? Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is risen. And then go tell the apostles the good news. And so that's why we emphasize the murder bearers a lot. And then the next thing that followed that is the epicoic. I don't know Greek, so I'm messing up these words a lot, but <clears throat> really, it means obedience, and it is a hymn that's usually uh, a single hymn, usually read 
Timothy refers to the command of the angels to the murdering women at the tomb. It differs depending on the tone of the week. Uh, this is an example of tone one. The repentance of the thief had gained him paradise, and the lamentation of the burbearing women had announced joy. For risen art thou of Christ our God, grant him to the world great mercy. Onita, this is an example of the murdering women who were lamenting on their way to the tombs, lamenting the, the, the death of Christ, are now announcing joy to the world. So these are great for the doxology. Yeah, yeah. This is these are actually the first half of our throats, way before the doxology. Oh, okay. And then the next set of hymns are what are called the uh Anabathamoi. Uh these are ascension hymns. Uh they, they were taken uh, from the original hymns of ascent that the Jews used to chant while they were ascending the 12 steps of the temple in Jerusalem in order to enter the temple for uh, Sabbath prayers. Today, these are uh, paraphrased. Uh, that we don't sing all 12 according to the tone of the week. Uh, the chanting is concluded with the Prohimenon, which is a, a verse from the Psalms that's chanted three times. So you'll hear the deacon say Prohimenon, and then he'll chant it. And then the gospel is read, the Matin gospel. The order of the Matin gospel is introduced with the chanting, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Again, from, from the Old Testament. On Sundays, it's one of 11 pre-selected readings having to do with Christ's resurrection. One of them is what we see on the screen here at the, the end of chapter of uh, Matthew's gospel, where Christ is giving his disciples Go and uh, baptize all nations in the name of the Trinity, uh, teaching them all that I have commanded you. That's one of the Gospels. Another one is the road uh, uh, to Emmaus, where the two of the disciples meet Christ on the road, and he's revealed to them as the resurrected Christ. Most of these Gospels, again, the myrrh-bearing women. And this icon shows on the left, the Murphy women meeting the angel at the tomb, telling them he is risen. On the right side, you see Christ with Mary Magdalene at his feet, uh, and saying, you know, uh, my Lord and my God. So just to clarify, the gospel and man's or orthos is not the same as the gospel of the Bible. Correct. Because these gospels, 11 of them, all talk about the resurrection of Christ only. And then that's the same here in left also? Yes. Yeah. Uh, following the gospel is Psalm 50. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy great mercy. Showing uh, the repentance and God's mercy and the prophesying about salvation through baptism. One of the verses in Psalm 50, thou shalt sprinkle me with his up, I shall be clean. Thou shalt watch me, I shall be whiter than snow. What do we put on after our baptism? Oh my God. Immediately before the 50th Psalm, and every day during the Paschal season, the prayer, having beheld the resurrection of Christ, let us bow down before the Holy Lord Jesus, the only sinless one. And then as it goes on, we hear that prayer as well. Every Sunday during Matins, and every time uh, during uh, the Paschal season. The Psalm of the Pentecost all the no. Sure. Traditionally, Psalm 50 is chanted very quickly. Usually here, it's read by one of the chanters. The following death is a Pentecostarian. Uh, this is another chant. Uh, and they, we uh, ask the apostles and the Theotokos to intercede for us to blot out our transgressions, blot out our many, many transgressions. Again, intercessional. And finally, uh, this last phrase, uh, we say, Jesus, having risen from the grave as he foretold, has granted us eternal life and great mercy. This actually closes what they call the gospel part of Orthros. Okay, this, this whole section is all the gospel section. 
Finally, the Kentuckian, Oikos, and Synoxarian. A Kentuckian, simply put, is a large, complex poem set to uh, music and verse. And it goes back to St. Romanos, the Melodist, during the sixth century. He was one of the first to compose these Kentuckia. And his masterpiece is the Kentuckian of Christmas. The Virgin cometh today to the, uh, to the cave to give birth. That whole, that's his masterpiece, that whole hymn. <laughs> now, this, this is why uh, man usually goes three hours in the monasteries, because they would have these Kentuckia uh, having 18 to 24 stanzas, and they would chant them all. So this thing, this uh, Kentuckia could go on for a half hour or more. Uh, and luckily for us, uh, there's only two, and they're usually only uh, chanted uh, very briefly. They're just really a compression of all of those chants, followed by the Synaxarian, which is usually read, never chanted, and it summarizes the saint of the day. And today we have St. Thomas, and so we'll hear about him uh, during the service, during the Divine Liturgy, we'll hear his hymn. But if we were as matins now, we would hear uh, the reader talk about St. Thomas and actually going to give a summary of his life. Usually the Divine Liturgy doesn't start on time. Usually it's because the matins is going too long. Sometimes and the chants are going too long. And the chants are going longer. Because now we're getting into the last part of the last part of Orthos with the Katavasis, and these are longer, slower chants. So these take, and when they're done properly, they can take a long time. And so each ode of now this canon uh, is, has a Katavasia, which is chanted, and uh, they also uh, change from, from uh, week to week, depending on the tone. So is, is it possible to follow all this stuff? I mean, is there, is there, yeah. Is, in, is all of it is in this book? It's in the book. Uh, the variable ones, they're going to change. Our book, the Red Service book, I think only has tone one. So if we're not in tone one, you're not, you're not going to know what's going on. Now, if you have your cell phone and you go to Antiochian.org and you got to you know, navigate a little bit, you go to liturgics, You'll find the PDF for the Orthros of the day, and yeah. the whole service there. Yeah, a lot of it too you know, is from like the the diocese too. They kind of because there's a number of different saints and they they can commemorate. They kind of will pick and send that down, right? Exactly. To, yeah, so that's that's how they say. If you go to Antiochian.org, that comes right from the archdiocese, so you will have the most recent updated versions uh, for every service, every Sunday, and all the feast days, and then during uh, uh, Lent and Paschal season. All of those will be on on up. So if you, yeah, if, you, if somebody said, hey, you're, I saw you looking at your phone during Orthros, well, that's because I was following the service. Sure. The five boundaries. <laughs> they are in the five boundaries. Yeah, that's, have, that's the big thing. Yes, yeah, you've got the five pound Nasser. Um, that it's all in there, too. Uh, it's a little di different uh, language. The Nasser is a little older uh, language uh, construct, construct, so it may not be the same. <laughs> but yeah, it's actually exactly the same uh, service. Uh, the Katavasya just meant uh, the, the chanter would come down off of their. They would be on a high level. They would come down to chant the Katavasya in the uh, middle of the church. That's why it's called Katavasya. It means descend. Descend. Uh, one of the nice, nicest part of the Katavasya, the very last uh, ode, the, the deacon comes out, he's the Theotokos and the mother of the light, let us honor and magnify in song. That's called the Megalinarian. And that's on a typical Sunday. It's called the 
Magnificat in, in Latin, and it's um, right out of Luke uh, chapter one, where the Theotokos meets her cousin Elizabeth, uh, and they meet each other. And Elizabeth says, uh, you know, uh, what, what is, why is it granted to me to meet the mother of my Lord? And the, the Theotokos says, my soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. That's because the first word is megala, megalino, megalino, which means I magnify. Mm -hmm. So I magnify the Lord. The, it's also called uh, the Timiotera because between each verse, we think <laughs> more honorable than the cherubim and more glorious beyond compared to the seraphim. That goes in between every verse of the Magnificat. Okay. And so if we're in church soon enough, we'll be able to get to that point. Probably not today. Uh, and again, out of respect for the Theotokos, the chanters would come down from their elevated place to say that. By the way, more honorable than the cherubim, more glorious beyond compared to the seraphim. Look at the size of the Theotokos here compared to the seraphim next to her. So iconographically, this is portrayed as her being more glorious than the seraphim. Imagine that. Here's a human being, the most glorious other than Christ and, and the Trinity, who is so magnified. And that is why we call her you know, more honorable than the seraphim. Finally, the ex area. These again are hymns that have the subject matter, the verb bearing women, always themed to the resurrectional gospel of that day. When the gospel is read of that day, these hymns reflect that gospel. Uh, and then finally, the praises. And this is where the really, the, the uh, Orthros can go long, the praises can go on forever. And there again, hymns of praise the Lord, all ye hosts, praise him, all ye people. And then it goes on. And then there's a hymn in between each one. Finally, the doxat stikon, stikon, uh, again, glory to the Father and to the Son. This is now leads us into uh, the great doxology. The one doxastikon, that doxastikon, doxastikon, that is always read is this one. Most blessed art thou, O Virgin Theotokos, for through him that was incarnate of thee is Hades despoiled, Adam is recalled from the dead, the curse is made void, Eve is death free, death is slain, and we are endowed with life. Think about that. That encapsulates all the salvation that Christ did for us through the Theotokos. Yeah. All of all of it right there. All of those things in Genesis that the earth, man is cursed, Eve is cursed, Adam is slain, all of that's reversed. Wherefore, in hymns of praise, we cry aloud, Blessed art thou, O Christ our God, with us well these glory to thee. We give glory to God. That's the doxa part. But we also uh, commemorate the say of Thomas as well. And then finally, we hear glory to thee who has shown us the light. Now this is the bridge that leads us to the divine liturgy. This is the first verse of the great doxology. After the hymns of praise, the priest opens the door, the holy doors, glory to thee who has shown us the light, inviting the faithful to glorify God who has given us the spirit, the light of the spirit, Christ our savior, who came into the world to illuminate mankind. And then the great doxology is called great because it is the most majestic and full of grandeur. It's the ultimate glorifying him to God. The, pre, uh, the deacon senses the whole church purifying us and the worship space. And then the hymn of resurrection is sung. So just before the uh, visiting choir breaks up, they sing one more hymn. And it varies between tones one to four and five to eight. 
And today we will hear, having risen from the tomb, having burst the bonds of Hades, you did lose the condemnation of death, releasing all men from the snares of the enemy. Remember who the enemies are, the demons. We've been released from them. You manifested yourself to the apostles. You sent them forth to proclaim thee. You granted us peace to the, to the whole world. So when chanted properly, the orthros flows majestically and paints a picture of Christ's resurrection as the ultimate sacrifice for the salvation of our souls. Magnificent service. Hopefully one of these Sundays, maybe we'll not have class and we'll actually go to orthros and listen to it in its completeness. All right, any questions, anything? I hope you've given us an appreciation of orthros. And uh, John Money will get there. You might be able to surprise our audience. No, no question. But I hope I haven't bored you, but I hope it's been uh, in my it's just, it's just a lot of stuff. It is. That way, it's the most complex service in the whole of all the services. It's a lot of stuff put, put all in here. So if we hurry, we can make it for the last part of the whole Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Thank you for being here. Oh. Well. Yeah. 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 Yeah.